Good afternoon, guys. Shall we start? I need your concentration, OK? Uh, I don't want to talk to myself. I need your interaction. Uh, please stop me whenever you need we have any question, anything you don't understand, any term or terminology which is new for you, we can stop and discuss it together, okay? Uh, if you feel you don't want to concentrate, just leave the room, or else it will be real irritating for me. Do you agree? Yes? No? Tayyib, let's start. Uh, so hi and welcome to this lecture this afternoon, which will introduce our reading for, do we have more light here? <coughs> I can't read the text, do we have a light? Hello? No. no. <coughs> Sorry. I try my best. So if you have noticed by now, our reading during the second part of CVSP 205 are concerned with questions of belief. <coughs> belief in the theological sense, Iman, as we are going to see in a minute. And the nature of the relationship between man, woman, and God. Readings of this nature, we give them the general name of te theology. Logy, like biology, like sociology, means the discourse of, the science of, okay, is the study of. Now, what do we do with theo? Theo is the name of the unity that we call now today God. It's a Greek word, by the way. Any God, any creative power that we can think of, the Greeks thought of, is Theo. So Theology is the study of the Theo, like biology, okay? <coughs> so this is the systematic study of the first being, Theology. As we have seen in the first set of our readings this semester, Plato marks the start of sustained philosophical thinking about the nature of the immaterial realm. Do you still remember the Plato's Republic? Similar of the cave, there is an immaterial realm, okay? So the first systematic approach, if you want, to this relation between the idea of justice, the idea of me as a human being living in a society with relation to my human fellows, in together in a relation to an immaterial realm which is outside this universe has been started with Plato. Thank you. His disciple Aristotle argues that there has to be a first immutable and immaterial source of each and every change. Please, if you want to talk, just leave. Hey, leave. Look, it's not easy to come and give a lecture, okay? I know my lecture, I know my material. I want it to be interactive. I think no punishment, just leave. Thank you, huh? And I'm sorry for shouting, but it's very irritating. Okay, please stop me anytime and we can interact. I'll pose questions at you, but don't talk. These two Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, prof had profound influence on the theological meditations in the three, and please concentrate with me, a new term, Abrahamic religions. I mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All these three religions consider themselves as Abraham's progeny, Zuriyat Ibrahim. Ibrahim is this patriarch, the biblical patriarch, which we found in the Bible and in the Quran, okay? So Abraham's progeny carrying his legacy, Mirath Ibrahim. Rich parallels of attitude and institution exist among these three religions that acknowledge in varying degrees their evolution out of each out of the other. Yani we have first Judaism, Christianity, and then comes Islam. 
With the coming forth of the idea, another, uh, sorry, with the idea of monotheism. You can see it there, down there, mono is one, okay? And theism from Theo, we said the God, theism, يعني, the religions believing in one deity. Theo is the deity. Theology, the study of the deity, and monotheism is the study of these religions, we call them Abrahamic, because they believe in one deity. Okay, and we are going to discuss it. So with the coming forth of the idea of monotheism, belief in one God that characterizes the Abrahamic tradition, a paradigm shift was introduced in human thought. I'll, I'll uh, explain what is paradigm and what is a paradigm shift in a minute. I reiterate, please, again, do stop me if you have any questions. So this is the monotheistic paradigm. Reality's ultimate principle is one God who is ultimate goodness. We know this from Plato, by the way, and we know it by, uh, by Aristotle as well. If you read Aristotle in 205, I forgot if you read Aristotle. This God created the world out of nothing. Perhaps out of an atom, okay? But out of nothing, basically. This is what we call in, in Latin, ex nihilo, okay? Out of nothing. This God, he, capital he, is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And I call them the three omnis. This is Latin, by the way. Omni means all. All potent, yani all powerful. Potent is, you know, the, the vital essence. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient, I think Americans say omniscient, whatever. Omniscient is all-knowledgeable from science. And he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. So this God is separate from the world. He is one God. He created the world out of nothing, all of us, everything in the universe, okay? And he knows everything. This would create problems for us as we proceed now with Al-Ghazali and others, okay? Uh, yeah, and this God is everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere, knows everything before it happens, and he's present everywhere, okay? So this is the paradigm, and I'll tell you in a minute what is the meaning of a paradigm. So the term paradigm is a term used to describe, you can read it there, the set of experiences, beliefs, and values that affect the way an individual and or a community perceives reality. Yani we are living today in the paradigm of globalization, technical paradigm of globalization. Yani wherever you go, all over the world, any society, 70% less suppose, 60% in some societies less or more, we define the way we think is similar. Yani TV, electronic media, social media, all of us, have, not all of us. We are talking about yani welfare societies, and that's the, it's a paradigm of globalization. Some 200 years earlier, the paradigm was different. Yani imagine my grandmother, not your grandmother, okay? My grandmother, who was born at the beginning of last century. Uh, and imagine me as a small kid or as a youngster in 1960s, at that time we didn't even have television, by the way, and not, no refrigerator, okay? It was a different paradigm. Yeah, and imagine me at that point, me telling my grandmother that she can take a plane today from Beirut and arrive after 11 hours to New York. She can't perceive it, okay? Because she was living in a different paradigm in a different scientific setting, in a different way of life. So, a paradigm, look up there, describes set of experiences, beliefs and values that affect that, that, that. A pattern or model of thought, a theoretical framework, usually it's scientific. To have a shift in a paradigm, I, use, I need a scientific revolution of a kind. Of a kind. Like if you change the society and social practices, the way we live, then we understand. Yani I'm sure the paradigm we're living in now is shifting, come on, a little bit. It is an entire constellation of belief, values, techniques. It's not only values. I underline all the time techniques and science, as we're going to see. 
So a generally accepted model for making sense of phenomena in a given discipline at a particular time. This is a paradigm. The word was formed together by a German uh, a philosopher of science uh, in the mid 20th century, and since then we talk of paradigm and the paradigm shift. What is a paradigm shift? A whole, sometimes it's not a new paradigm. Now, my theory shift with paradigm, it introduces a new paradigm. Sometimes within a certain paradigm, I start having shifts. You know it from sciences, those who study, who study sciences, biology and physics and chemistry and whatever. The paradigm we're talking about is a monotheistic paradigm. It is not the Greek paradigm that you've studied in the first part of your readings in CVS 4 This was a Greco-Greco-Roman paradigm. I hate labels. I don't want to give labels and names now. Okay, we can discuss it in class, what is the paradigm? The paradigm that we are doing now is a major shift. You started by reading St. Augustine, Christianity, how do I understand uh, God, how do I understand myself, how do I understand love to God, my memory, my role as a hu responsible human being in the world. It's an Abrahamic paradigm. Now we're moving to the Islamic part of the Abrahamic paradigm. Uh, I won't read everything now, but let me just, uh, contrary to the Greek and Hellenistic paradigms, the Abrahamic, monotheistic. Now we've learned new words. We've learned Abrahamic, the progeny of Abraham, monotheistic from mono and teo, the deity, and the word paradigm. This new paradigm rotates around the concept Try to follow me, okay? And I'll ask questions. Of loss of the human purity and guiltlessness and the misfortunes that follow. Can you give me examples from St. Augustine? I repeat, this new paradigm revolves around a basic theme, one of the basic themes. The first basic theme, God is one and separate. Second, God created the word ex nihilo, okay, out of nothing. Third, God is omniscient, the three omnis, okay? Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Tayyib, meshil hal. This is about God. What about me as a human being? This paradigm, like any other paradigm, has two poles. God is up there somewhere, transcendental, fine, ala aini rasi, we accept. But what is my role? By the way, theology, although we say it's the study of the deity, actually it studies three things. And my question is still there. I'll come back to questions, so think about it. Theology studied, our studies try to study God. Yani the characteristics of the deity, we've just seen them. He's one, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. Second, it study the relationship of woman, me as a human being, to God. Third, how is the relationship between me as a human being and you as a human being defined within the understanding of the paradigm? Responsibility. Love. But again, I repeat, I'm saying, I'm claiming that this monotheistic paradigm, Abrahamic paradigm, revolves around the idea of loss of purity. Does it ring a bell somewhere? Saint Augustine or other things? Yalla, let me see uh, your hands. Hello, hey, please. Uh, original sin, what do you mean? Come here, come close. You cannot, of course, definitely. Yes, uh, yes original sin, what do you mean? But raise your voice. What do you mean by original sin? Original sin, I mean, because he disobeyed God, and she's now, and she's you were sexist, yes, okay, fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, love my word. I know, I know, I know. Thanks a million, thank you very much. This is a very clever answer, by the way, and more clever than she told me. It's not my idea, I'm telling you what, uh, what happened. And I was a little bit like, provocative, saying you're sexist. Fine, yes, this is it. This idea that we have in these three religions, different in each one than the other, that there was a previous good life in a garden up there or somewhere east of Eden, a garden, 
God created Adam and Eve out of nothing, by the way. And because he's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, he knew everything they were doing. I didn't knew beforehand that something wrong is going to go there. This is symbolically underlined. This is one of the fourth characteristics of the Abrahamic monotheistic religion, symbolism. And the role of language. Manata, when I read a garden, Adam and Eve, a tree, came a snake, what have you, do you want to believe this as something tangible that happened? Or as a lesson, an example on which the paradigm is building for me to understand? We'll come to all these questions. But keep it in mind now. Uh, so, this loss was caused after the creation of man and woman, right before the eyes of God. Now, like and the paradigm is built on loss, but we can't build a paradigm only on loss. This is the negative thing about it. The positive thing about it, that God, in his mercy and with his love, to humanity, which he created out of nothing, is going to interfere in history. This we call, underline, you don't underline, if you have pencils and pens, write it, salvation history. And I'm um, to simplify things, okay? And to address them. These are complicated things. Uh, scholars and philosophers and theologians and scientists are working on these things. But if we want to understand them, let's put them this way. Salvation history, being God's interferes in history. Through sending prophets, or in Christianity, through sending his own son, who was crucified for our sake, to redeem us as redemption. Sending Muhammad as a prophet with the final message and with the final words of God. Or in Abrahamic religion, God addressed, spoke to Moses directly behind the bush, the burning bush, Mazbut on Mount Sinai. And he gave him with his right hand the five tablets. Okay? Type. Please, what have, what, have we, what have been we talking about this paradigm? Can we again reiterate, repeat three, four things that take out this paradigm? Loss. Yes. Another thing. Salvation. God intervenes in history. God knows everything, Ilna. It is a monotheistic paradigm. Let me move, and we can't stop at this point. Now, a paradigm refers to the conceptual framework and or world views of a certain culture at a certain time in history. Culture or cultures, as you see down there, a cultural paradigm might overreach many cultures. It becomes globalized, by the way. Now, let us see what are the basic things that make the monotheistic Abrahamic paradigm, and then I move directly afterwards to Al-Ghazali. Common elements in the Abrahamic paradigm are the following. Divinity. A belief in a transcendental God. We talked about it, okay? Omniscient, omnipresent, what have you. Scripture. Script communication. Mazwood, Bish. God addressed, talk to Abraham behind the burning bush. And with God's right hand, he gave him down five tablets. Gave him down five written tablets, Leish. He's opening communication. He told him, go to your people, read to them these five tables. If you want to have communication with me, because I am the creator and I am the savior, this is the communication between you and I. Language. God took to Moses and gave him written tablets in Hebrew. Another sort of communication, God sent his only son as a human being to humanity, lived among us, Mazbut, and was crucified for our sake. And Jesus, his disciples, has written down his life and his words 
communication. Muhammad, the last prophet, came with the final word of God in Arabic this time. Mazboot? To do what? To communicate with us. Why didn't God address people in Hindu and in American and in French and German? All these texts were translated. Ma'nata, the text is open to humanity in its entirety and in time. Ma'nata, communication through language. And don't forget, and at least I'm claiming that this language is symbolic. Okay? Now, these are the basic things within the paradigm. Now, sin. Sin, this differs a little bit, okay? St. Augustine concentrated a lot on sin. Oh, man, yani needs. This is why we need Christ in order to save us, okay? In Islam and Judaism, we don't have sin. We have a khata, khatai in uh, 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 Hebrew, khata in Arabic. Okay, uh, uh, it's solvable. I, as a human being, tawba return to God. I don't need someone who interferes, intermediates between me and God. The relationship in Judaism and Islam is direct with this God. Okay, Christianity, it is different, but the ideas are there. So sin is one of the ideas. Let us move. Sorry, this was an introduction because I think I've taught to one and two or five, four years, many years. Okay. Uh, this shift from Greco-Roman cultures that we were reading, and all of a sudden we drop into Saint Augustine and we hear a lecture about existentialism, and I don't know what. It's very difficult. Okay, so and I, I want to simplify and I want to understand things as they are. Now, Ghazali or Ghazali, it's all the same now, no big problem. I'm not going to talk about his life. The major thing that he lived in the fifth Islamic century. Okay, yani in the 11th century, he was born in Tours, northern Iran. Tours, Lyom is part of the uh, bigger city, province of Tehran. He studied in two Zurjan and Nishapu. Zurjan, yani, we're going up to the Caspian Sea. Okay? Where from comes this Arabic Islamic culture? Components are Persian, are uh, Turkmenistan, by the way, Turkish. And Nishapu. Nishapu doesn't exist anymore. It was not one city, seven cities, okay? He was appointed for the chair of law in the Nizamiya Madrasa of Baghdad. By the way, Nizamiya Madrasa, these are the colleges and universities of Islam. Okay? Uh, Nizamiya, because of Nizam al Mulk, you discuss this in class if you want, or Google it, okay? I'm not here to talk about uh, specific things in his life. Uh, he had a serious spiritual crisis upon which he left Baghdad, where he was teaching, giving his position, position as a university professor and renouncing the word. Now we are going to concentrate on giving up his position, spiritual crisis, and renouncing the word. Yani imagine me now as a professor at UB, in this age where I'm yani, retiring, is a bit gone, having spent now 23 years in academia, reading and writing and going through exams every day and every year to reach this position, I become depressed, I have a serious depression, Whatever the reason is, either because I'm thinking of, is it useful just to talk and lecture to young people where I myself am not working on myself? Inwardly, wahad, I don't want to teach anymore. The crisis, his spiritual crisis, we say spiritual, it has to do with the spirit. It has to do with his own understanding of his relationship to God, to creation, and to the other in the society. Fahid decides, all this is hypocrisy. This teaching at university, position, you know, you drive your BMW. Uh -uh. This is not what I want. Okay? Ghazali was doing this at his time, yani. Okay? This is not what I want. So he, first he stays at home with total, by the way, frustration and depression. 
not taking care of his family, of his children, of his wife, of whatever. And then he moves to Damascus. Masjid al-Umawi in Damascus. He lives there for two years, I think. Don't quote me for the word. It's either two or four years or ten months. Nsita Allah, okay? He living in the minaret of the Umayyad Mosque. Then he goes to Jerusalem, spends other two, three years, only in contemplation. Underline, renouncing the word. How do I renounce the word? Zuhd. During the month of Ramadan, or Nhalla, a Christian uh, a fasting, which comes in uh, some months, okay, we fast. We start renouncing the words. You know, you eat in the evening. You go to the tent. This is not the idea. The idea is during a month or during a lifetime for these people that we call Zuhad. You care less about good food. You care less about, you know, your Nike and your uh, 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 everything that is material. And you concentrate, you think that life is shorter and much more intensive to think about your relation with other people and relation to God than to material things. I'm coming back to this. Look, I'm not preaching here. I'm just taking the role to try this, to, to give, يعني, to, that this lecture reaches you. Let's move from Ghazali, we don't have much time. So he started in uh, Palestine and Syria and came back. Now the book we are reading. This book is called The Rivers from Error al munqidh bin Abdullah. You need to know one thing, and it's a crucial thing. This book was written during the last 10 years of his life. It was written after he decided to teach, to, to go back to teaching. Not at a university, not at the American University of Beirut, not at the Nizamiya. He had only something between 100, 200 elect students who were doing with him not only studying, but spiritual training. And he is writing for them a summary. This is a summary. It's a small book, by the way. He jumps from one topic to the other topic. These are lectures telling his students about, especially all these students who were Sunni Muslim at that time. Sunni Islam was the basically the religion of the state. Ghazali is within this trend. Nizam al-Mulk, this vizier who is a Seljuk, by the way, Turk. Kaman, he was defender of Sunni Islam. At that time, the main uh, 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 adversary, or the main problem, was with Ismailiya, who were ruling in Baghdad, a huge empire, you know, very powerful and scientific, and sciences were... Uh, this is the political aspect of it. Ma'anata Ghazali, if you see, he is attacking four kinds of people, as we're going to read. First, the theologians, although he himself is a theologian. But at the end of his life, after his crisis, he thought that, you know, a direct relationship to God, a simple direct relationship to God, renouncing the word is the way to understand the word and God, and to build a relationship with God. So he is addressing first the theologians. The philosophers, Ghazali thinks at that time that studying philosophy might corrupt the mind might not only corrupt the mind, might give you a different approach to understanding the word and God, which is not healthy. Although, let us not forget, his book in philosophy is an excellent book. Ghazali is such a multifacious, okay? He's a philosopher, he's a theologian, he's, he writes Arabic beautifully, he writes Persian beautifully. He's a sha'ir, he's a faqih, yani jurisprudence, okay? All these together. Now, again, I reiterate, the book was written at the end of his life. Meant, يعني, the narrative, the one who is receiving the messages, are his students. He is writing a summary to his students. Students trust in him, telling him, look. And he is training them in Sunni Islam to go back and work in the state or in the society. Avoid theology, avoid philosophy, avoid Ismailiyah, and he's telling us why, and stick to the way, the road, at tariq 
اوكي الطريق طريق التصوف سو هي ستارتس ذا بوك باي سكيبتيسيزم باي ادريسينج ذا بوينت سكيبتيسيزم اند اي وونت تو اي ستيل هاف سمثينغ لايك 15 مينتس ليت مي ستوب ات سكيبتيسيزم اي ريد ناو اند بليز ستوب مي ها لايك اغسطين لانه يو نو اغسطين يو فريد اغسطين Like Agassiz, Al Ghazali also has passed through a deep moral crisis that shook his whole being. He portrays this crisis in his intellectual autobiography. It's an intellectual. This book that we are reading now is an intellectual autobiography. Autobiography, I mean, Sira Dhatiya. But not Sira Dhatiya in 1,000 pages or 500 pages telling me everything about my life, ta-ta, ta-ta, no. It's intellectual in the sense it's precise. It addresses intellectual things. Intellectual things at the end of this life, autobiography telling me, look, I'm giving you the creme de la creme of my thought and my experience. In this autobiographical communication, Al-Ghazali starts off from skepticism. Shak bil Arabi. Doubt. Skepticism. Skepticism questions whether any knowledge or justification is possible at all. It is concerned with the questions of the reliability of our senses. Our senses, and for that matter, even the electronic materials and instruments, okay, that are an aid to my senses. I don't think in Ghazali is only talking about his time. Even when he gives us the example of if you take a coin and you look at the sun through the coin, you think that the sun is so small, okay? All hadiths are simplified, simplistic examples. They are not. Or when he tells us that, you know, if we use mathematics, to help to aid us to a higher understanding of the universe and what happens in the universe, this is not enough. Skepticism is not created by Al-Ghazali. This is what I'm trying to show here. This is a tradition that started in Greek philosophy, by the way. Uh, back in antiquity, in later antiquity. Especially the school which flourished during the third century of our era, yani. Common era, okay, against empiricism, which regards sense experience to be the criterion of truth about external realities. Yani, skepticism goes with Ghazali so far as telling us there might be behind the realm of intelligence, behind the realm of reason, another realm which we can compare to as to dream to our life. Ma'neta, he's telling us, our senses, all our experimentation through electronics and whatever you want is not enough to understand the world around us. This is deep skepticism. And the, the truth, to find the truth, the truth is something beyond and behind, but we have a communication through the truth Please understand with me for the time, and these two words. There is within the heart, and the heart doesn't mean the heart, يعني, albil, which pumps like this. The heart in Islamic philosophy, and by the way, antiquity, means the sum total of my spirit. By the way, the Arabs love from the tal. From the pancreas. Love for the Arabs is the pancreas, not in the heart. For I come my heart, you don't think about love and love is this inner sum total of my personality. So he believes that there, the seed, there is the seed for communication with the divine. If the meaning of the word is a communication with the divine, if God has created me out of nothing and is omniscient, omnipresent, and if I am responsible as a human being after the loss. I have responsibility as a human being. It's not only that I was created and within 80, 90 years, I pass away and perish. The monotheistic religion believes in life after death. Ghazali tells us all our life is only like a dream. And we wake up when we die. It, it, this, is, this is fascinating. 
This is fascinating. Because it is a dream, we cannot use experimentation. You can't use experimentation in your dream while you are dreaming. Even if you think in your dream, you dream of, you know, all kinds of electronics and techniques, and, and you wake up, you did nothing. You've just peed on yourself while sleeping. This is Ghazali. Okay? For he tells us, it's more serious. And again, I'm not preaching. Believe me, I'm not preaching. This is not my sort of life. I'm not my cup of tea. Okay, I'm trying to introduce Ghazali to you. Okay, so what shall we do? He tells us, look, work on yourself, work on your heart. The heart is not only a pump of blood. This is the center of all communications and the center of understanding. If you purify the heart, and you need to purify your heart all the time in order to catch the rays and send them back. So it's communication through this mode of, this is the final thing, and the final chapter in his book, he tells us about the role of Nubuwa. Why, why Muhammad, for Islam now, okay, why is Muhammad the Haqiqa Muhammadiya. Why is my communication, my understanding of the word, and my communication to God should go through the Haqiqa Muhammadiya? And why should I emulate Muhammad, live according to the way that Muhammad lived? He tells us that this is the way. So the best way for him is to renounce, denounce the word, Zod. Uh, this is not the intellectual thing. The intellectual core, you are going to read it in your classes. Let us see this. Higher perception. Al-Ghazali denies any necessary connection between cause and effect. There are some questions you have, uh, on your handouts that you need to think of, and I suggest that you address them in class. First, address them at home, amongst yourselves as well, and in class. Ghazali bi'ilna mafi, it's not cause and effect. Not that because every time I see a, a, a black cloud, this means that it would rain. Cause and effect is created by God and God can stop them at any moment. It happens so that for thousands and thousands of years, according to this skepticism, to this school of thought, that things seem to appear in cause and effect. Cause and effect do not exist. The word is not made out of this scientific thing of cause and effect. God is able to produce any effect without any intermediate cause at all. By the way, this is an... I still have some... Only 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, okay? Uh, can I introduce another school? Hey, but for, uh, are you following me, by the way? Hello? Yeah, okay. When we talk about Sunni Islam and we talk about Ghazali, or when we talk about Islam in general and we talk about Ghazali, by the way, this trend of thought that is introduced by Ghazali, we have it everywhere. It's not different than Augustine. Augustine had the same beliefs, but within his own uh, uh, approach, within his own Christian paradigm, okay? Mishel Naholi, three monotheistic uh, religions, Abrahamic, were three different paradigms, but they all belong to one paradigm, okay? Like, and they are not the only representative. And another school in Islam, which is the Mu'tazila, we don't have them today. Holy, these are the scientific people who believe in reason. But in like life, like we can study life. They are Muslims, they believe in God as omniscient, omnipresent, what have you. But in like I have a role in society. And I have a role in shaping my life and shaping the universe and shaping history for that matter. Okay, not everyone is skeptic and passive. In a sense, in a sense. Okay, type. The main problem between them, that the Mu'tazila tell me, look, and I do believe like you believe, Ghazali or other people, all these people in paradigm. God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, create the world out of nothing. There is a life after life, and God interferes in history. Now will be on the paradigm, and God addresses us. Type, what's the difference between Ghazali and others? What's the difference between Augustine, for that matter, and others? Others tell me in Islam, 
the other school, مش الغزالي, they tell me like I'm responsible as a human being. I can understand the word, and the word, they say it exactly like this. The word is created. God created the word. اكسنهلو على راسي وعيني اكسنهلو. By the way, اكسنهلو فيها question marks. If I want to go into. اكسنهلو for them mean that God created the word out of a single atom. Big bang, explosion, perhaps. هيدا عم بحكيك وانا انا انت تعرف غزالي and earlier. Okay? طيب. What does this mean? This means that it undergoes the scientific paradigm. مش a single atom, explosion, ولا whatever, معناتها, and it's still opening in time, معناتها I can study it. Who I, as a human being, endowed with reason, I'm the only creature that God created with reason, I can, with my reason, measure and study scientifically. طيب, the main question, by the way, that we know of, نحن بصير حادث بلك إيه ولا قضاء وقدر حرام, not that we are responsible. My government and you and I as civil society are responsible to avoid all these uh, 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 accidents. Around 780 ex uh, uh, deaths a year on the roads of Lebanon. If you compare them to the roads of the United States of America or Siberia or India, this number would raise up to 70,000 perhaps. Okay? When it's not a matter all the garbage over the street, hey, our politicians are rotten, qada u qadar. It's not qada u qadar. How am I going to organize my society? How am I going to understand the word scientifically? Why do I study at the American University of Beirut, biology and chemistry and philosophy and, and business and in order to grasp with my reason? This means that I have a responsibility. God created the world out of nothing. Single atom, explosion, endowed me with reason. Ma'nata, I can understand scientifically the word. Accordingly, I make my decisions. How do God interfere in history? Yes, God interferes in history, indeed. But through the word, He created the word. He created the word scientifically, which I can understand scientifically. If He interferes, He interferes in the sense is a Bitcoin, and this is the last simile I'm going to give. مثل ما بيل جيتس عمل. He created the computer and put it in the market. Created the computer now. Take my word uh, uh, symbolically, is a Bitcoin. Created the computer and put it in the market. I bought the computer. I'm stupid ass. I didn't know how to work with the computer. I can't every now and then take the telephone and call him. Hi, Bill. What shall I do now? Bill, come on. Go take a course in computer, a higher course in computer, and a higher course in, and a higher course in computer. For the ability of a computer can be used by me as a stupid person to 2%. You can use it up to 90% and fly with the computer to the seventh moon. صح ولا لا؟ صح. معنات I'm responsible, but the responsibility is according to my ability and what can I do of my ability? How do I train myself? Uh, sorry, I know this is the way I give lectures. I hate only just reading, but I'm trying to introduce many things. Taib, nirja to Ghazali. According to Ghazali, lakan ma fi scientific programized ila akhiri la. According to Ghazali, I understand the word and I reach God through zawq. Zawq has to do with taste. Of good taste, yes. But this is the taste of the heart. This is the experience, my experience. It's not only about science and physics. Let's not forget, he is a skeptic, and he doesn't believe in cause and effect. And he believes that God interferes in every split of a second, according to other schools in Islam, okay? Uh, the contrary to, uh, to other schools in Islam. And how do I live my life? I need to live my life, two things. Minimum of energy expenditure. You know, all this halabalu that we do about, hey man, and buying things, and, and like this has no sense. Concentrate all your energy inside your soul, to the seat of your soul, to the heart. Purify the heart, contemplate, and you go into an inner 
experiential. This is why we call it experiential. And then you have the taste, a dhawq. Okay? Beyond the stage of intellect, you can read the, beyond the stage of intellect, Shazghal Ghazali, there is another stage wherein an eye is opened by man, by which man sees the hidden. Please compare this eye of the soul, the sixth sense, with an eye which was, which you read in Augustine. And then he tells me, perhaps this life is only a state of dream. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, men are asleep. Then, after they die, they awake. Says Ghazali, so perhaps this present life is asleep compared to the afterlife. Fascinating, by the way. So what shall I do? Continuous training. If you want to play good basketball, go and watch basketball. Like, take off your clothes, wear your short, take the ball and start. Okay, practice. Start, practice, 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 practice. Tatallam rules while you are practicing. Practice now is a way of life. Scrupulous, 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 yani, uh, 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 Ktir shadid, observance of one's undertakings and doings with obedience and abstinence, wara, piety and humility, taqwa. So the road, the way, by the way, he's not different than any Christian or Judaic. Uh, uh, we can compare these people. This is why we read Ghazali, we read Saint Augustine, and we read after him Ghazali, okay? Two representatives of the same paradigm within the greater paradigm of monotheism. A process of self-examination, muhasaba, of training the self, it is based on fear, khawf, and hope. You can't take off fear from hope. By the way, in Christianity, we say, al-raja' bil qiyama. Okay, raja' bil qiyama, hope for resurrection because Christ was crucified because of, I believe, I, my hope, but there is fear in both. So khawf wa raja, khawf wa raja, fear and hope. Are there limits, now these are the questions, are there limits for scientific knowledge? Ghazali is telling us there are limits to scientific knowledge. The question posed to you today. Okay? By the way, what Ghazali is saying is not Islam, or what Augustine is saying, this is Christianity. No. This is an understanding, one trend of understanding. Another question. Are the material and dimensional features of the bodies separable from the bodies? Can we differentiate between the body and the soul, the inner soul, the inner self, the seat of the self, or not? These are questions for us today. What is skeptic epistemology? Skeptics and not trying skeptic. Epistemology is the study of, uh, yani, uh, of knowledge, indeed. Indeed, thank you. Can we gain data beyond the word of experience? Through the method that Ghazal is proposing? How can we define faith? How can we define reason? And I know most of us in this Lebanese, corrupt Lebanese society, you go to church, of course I go to church. But what is the meaning of, yes, I believe, yes, I go to church, yes, I pray five, five times a day. Is it only about, you know, having this thing here to say, tell people that I pray? Or, you know, carrying my cross and showing my community that I go every Saturday to every Sunday to church? Is this belief, guys? Now, this is time that Ghazali is posing to us, and Augustine before Ghazali. We, as grown-ups at the American University of Beirut, part of our training is to ask ourselves questions, by the way. One is the scientific question, and the other question is the question, my relation. When I say that theology is the study, understanding of the deity, of my relationship of the deity, and of my relation to my community, 
Okay. Ilaa, this is love, this is Christian love. This is rahma and tarahum in Islam. Okay. So, what is faith, by the way? How can we define faith and what is reason? Now, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope this was helpful. You can, you have my email and my extension number. Please don't hesitate to call, drop by, or uh, anything you want. Bye.